Thank you all, and welcome uh, to, to uh, how t Japanese cars are changing the world and insiders look. Uh, again, I'm Tim Stevens. I'm editor-in-chief of Roadshow, uh, CNN's new automotive property. And our speaker tonight is Peter Lyon, a Tokyo-based motor journalist and also the host of Samurai Wheels, which we were just getting a bit of a sneak peek at. Uh, Mr. Lyon got his BA in politics and Japanese studies from the University of Western Australia and went on to study advanced Japanese language at Japan's prestigious Keio University. He currently writes for six publications around the world, two in Japanese, is chairman of the World Car Awards, juror for Japan's Car of the Year, and a judge for Toyota's Dream Car Art Contest, uh, which is a long list, which is why I have to read it off of paper here. Uh, we're very pleased that he is here to speak with us tonight. Now, um, Mr. Lyon has a presentation he's going to be going through, but after that we will have a Q&A session, which we would definitely invite your questions. So uh, if you have any questions, please start to think of those. Uh, and after the presentation, we'll be happy to take those. Um, but now, without further ado, please welcome to the stage Mr. Peter Lyon. Imagine, if you will, the Australian outback in 1965. It was an easygoing place inhabited by kangaroos and sheep and redback spiders and wheat bales. Farmers drove land rovers, not land cruisers, while in the cities, families rode around in GM Holden and Ford sedans. We ate steaks and potatoes and Brussels sprouts. On TV, we watched American cowboys and Indians and spent hours role-playing in backyard battles. I took turns playing both cowboy and Indian as I enjoyed the challenge of untying myself. When Zorro came along, I hung up my six shooters and bought a black cape and costume. Guy Williams, who played the swashbuckling Zorro, became my superhero. Then, out of nowhere, came the samurai. with sword fighting skills and a swagger that completely eclipsed anything I'd seen from Zorro. To kids back then, this TV series seemed like, this TV series seemed like it was from another planet, not another country. It's star knife throwing ninja, strict code of samurai, intricately choreographed fight scenes and Japanese ethics and philosophy took Australia by storm in the mid 60s. Little did I know that at the tender age of five years old, my future had already been decided. I learned punctuality at five because I had to be home by five to watch the samurai. When the star of the show, Actor Koichi Ose visited Australia on a promotional tour in late 1965. He was met at Melbourne Airport by 7,000 screaming fans, all dressed in ninja and samurai outfits. You can see them in the bottom left-hand corner there. The media had a field day as they compared the samurai's visit to, and wait for it, the Beatles who had arrived at the same airport for a concert tour one year earlier. The, but the Fab Four only got a cr crowd of 5,000 fans. That's right, the Samurai had a greater impact on young minds in Australia than the Beatles did in 1965. And one of those kids was me. I did not realize until much later in life but that show is what influenced me. That is how I entered this world, the world of learning to speak Japanese and test driving and reporting about cars for living from Japan. Hello and welcome to my talk on how Japanese cars change the world. Today I'm going to tell you some stories of my 28 years of working in Japan as a motor journalist, author, racing driver, chairman of the World Car Awards, and one of only two foreign-born Japan Car of the Year jurors. And as you saw in the opening, I'm also the co-host of Japan's first ever international car show, 
Samurai Wheels on the national broadcast NHK, a show I co-host with ex-Formula One driver Ukyo Katayama. And I am thrilled to be here with you today. Thank you for having me. I suppose the best place to start is right at the beginning, or at least at the beginning for me. That was in 1988. Let me paint a picture for you. It's the 1980s, and Ronald Reagan is pressuring Japan to open its markets. Hollywood loves a good conflict, so it jumped on this opportunity to make some movies. In the 1986 flick Gung Ho, Michael Keaton plays a shady auto worker trying to pressure lazy Americans to work harder for less money after a Japanese company takes over an American car plant. In 1988, Bruce Willis plays John McClane, a New York cop who saves a Japanese company from a German terrorist group in the original Die Hard movie. In 1989, Michael Douglas seeks help from a Japanese cop in tracking down a rogue Yakuza in Black Rain. In reality, of course, these battles were not taking place on the 40th floor of the Nakatomi Plaza, but in the showrooms and design studios of global car makers. So I arrived in Japan in 1988 to start reporting on cars. Now that I look back, I arrived right at the start of Japan's golden era, a time that saw the launch of cars that would rock the automotive world to its very core, cars that are still having influence today. Just imagine, in a two-year period from 1989 to 1990, we saw the launch of the Honda NSX, the Nissan Skyline GTR, the Mazda MX-5 Miata, the Subaru Legacy, the launch of Lexus and Infiniti in the same year in the US, and of course, the game-changing Lexus LS400. I'm not, I haven't finished yet. The Toyota MR2, the Nissan 300ZX, and the Honda Accord and Honda Integra. All those cars were launched within a 24-month period. I thought, okay, if Japan can do this every year, then I have definitely come to the right country. But unfortunately, Japan could not maintain such an intense pace, although it did manage to keep the success stories coming in the form of hybrids, driving games, fuel cell cars, and world-beating four-wheel drive turbocharged sports cars. I will never forget one of the first interviews I had with a chief engineer. My no-holds-barred Australian publication had commissioned me to ask the chief engineer of the Lexus LS400 why his car resembled a certain German brand. After just a few months in Japan, I soon learnt that such straightforward confrontations are not the done thing here. Circumlocution is a virtue in Japan. So a couple of concerned Japanese colleagues gave me a crash course in local manners, trying to tame the wild young Australian. So when I arrived at the Toyota office in Tokyo to conduct a telephone conference with Mr. Ichiro Suzuki, not of the baseball fame, the LS's chief engineer, Ichiro Suzuki, I was ready to find a back door to the question that had to be asked. I first congratulated him on a masterpiece of engineering. The Ellis's quality, reliability, refinement, quietness, and cost performance were already sending shockwaves through the hallowed halls of Mercedes and BMW. The Germans could not ignore this wake-up call. I remember writing at the time, it's so quiet, you can't even tell the engine's on. It's faster than a BMW, more luxurious than a Mercedes, and cheaper than both. And because it's a Toyota, it won't break down. But whichever angle you looked at it, you could not help but see design cues that resembled a certain German automaker. So I said to him, 
Your design is very crisp and clean. What inspired your styling? When he said that his styling was completely new and inspired by no one, I had to circumlocute. Please excuse the views of some of my European colleagues and I, but we cannot help seeing some minor design nuances that hint at certain lines from a Mercedes-Benz. After all, that is your main rival in this segment, correct? To this comment, he smiled wryly and said, well, yes, I have heard such remarks before, but believe me when I say the LS is an original Lexus design. It was influenced by no car maker. And that, of course, is the story that I had to write, although I could see some design influences from Germany. But it seemed like I'd crossed the line because Mr. Suzuki never spoke to me again. <laughs> That's when I learned an important lesson. Even, in the, even if the world thought your car might have borrowed a few minor details from another automaker, the corporate line in this country was to dismiss such remarks and push originality. The same thing happened when I chatted with a designer of the Honda NSX in 1990. But although the coupe did hint at certain Ferrari design cues, something he did not dispute, the NSX's build quality, handling, and levels of technology sent a tsunami wave through Ferrari. Honda's president at the time, Nobuhiko Kawamoto, had told me at the car's launch, today's Ferraris are dinosaurs, he said. They are big and impressive, but they have not adapted to the needs of the times, and that may be their downfall. He may well have suggested that Ferrari would pay attention to his supercar. After all, the NSX's level of technology, ease of driving, and its reliability had not only caught the prancing horse boys off guard, but made Ferrari's bosses stand up and take note. Their clunky 328 model seemed like it was from the dark ages when compared with the all aluminium NSX a mid-engine sports car that boasted more than 20 industry-first technologies, including the world's first ever independent four-wheel ABS and electronic power steering. It was the most sophisticated and modern sports car on the planet at that time. Within months, the first driving reports started to appear. This Honda, or as you say in America, this Acura, was good. No, it was better than that. It was great. Ferrari, Porsche and Jaguar had been put on notice. The NSX, partially developed at the Nürburgring and Suzuka circuit, was better in every way and those supercars owe their quality and reliability to the NSX. When the Mazda MX-5 burst onto the world stage in 1989, the fact that it took inspiration from the Lotus Elan was quickly lost in the car's superb handling, great build quality, class-leading cost performance, and wind-in-the-hair thrill factor. It soon went on to win numerous awards, including Autocar's Best Driver's Car Trophy, and sparked a boom in roadsters globally giving birth to such cars as the Porsche Boxster, the BMW Z3, the Mercedes SLK, and the Audi TT. When the second generation MX-5 was launched in 1998, I went down to Hiroshima to interview the chief engineers of the first and second generation cars, Toshihiko Hirai and Takao Kijima. Given that this car had become such a huge success story, the brand's iconic car listed in the Guinness Book of Records with over 950,000 sales, I expected to hear stories of triumph. But the truth was far from that, as the two engineers told me how the hardships and struggles they had 
to get this car out of the design room and onto the road. He and Kijima had worked on the project from the beginning. Firmly, they firmly believed that for this car to be a success, it had to have rear wheel drive and a 50-50 front rear weight distribution. But the Mazda marketing boys, who only crunched numbers, drove Hirai to threats of resignation at their insistence that the car should be front wheel drive to save money. If we did a front wheel drive car, he said, we'd just end up making a marginal success, not a big hit. Anyone who enjoys cars and sports driving knows the difference between a front wheel drive car and a rear wheel drive car. In the project's early days, Mazda bosses gave these two engineers a hard time too, making it difficult for them to source talented engineers and designers. Kijima told me that his wife wondered what was happening. Was my husband seeing another woman? Because for a month, every night, he would be late getting home because he was working on a secret project that he could not talk about. Until the project was fully sanctioned by Mazda management, Hirai's team had to finish their work on other projects during the day and then meet for a couple of hours after work each night to plan the MX-5. After a special plea from Hirai, bosses finally came to their senses, gave the go sign, and allocated a good group of engineers and designers. Now, when you think of it, it's hard to believe that a coupe, which has become the number one brand image for Mazda, nearly did not happen because of some screwed up marketing strategy. If you look at the example of the MX-5 and also the Datsun 240Z, which was born in 1969, it would seem that many engineers and marketing gurus have had to battle with their bosses to get their cars made. As we have just seen, Hirai had to fight hard to get his MX-5 off the ground. Ex-Nissan USA president, Yutaka Katayama, who became known as the father of the Z, had to persevere with Nissan's top brass for several years in the early 60s before they gave a green light to develop the 240Z and the 510, two cars that put Datsun on the map and forced the likes of Porsche to rethink their lineup. Several years ago, I interviewed Mr. K at the tender age of 99. And the story I heard was a very different one from the incredible success story I expected to hear about the 240Z. Even in his early 30s, Nissan bosses had tested Mr. K. From before the Second World War, management had sent him to places that he did not want to go like Manchuria in 1939. When he finally refused to go back, after they said, you're going back in 1945, bosses came up with another idea. He told me the company soon branded him the three E's, expendable, exiled, and eccentric, <laughs> and had to place him elsewhere in the organization. Some 15 years later, Nissan bosses banished him from Japan to the US after he won a rally in Australia and brought glory home to Nissan. They expected him to go down under and lose, not come back with a trophy. They dispatched him to shut him up, but he'd proven them wrong again. He told, them, he, he told me he was actually glad to have been exiled to America as it gave him a chance to make a real difference. Going against the grain and thinking outside the box were not desirable traits of a corporate man back then, he said. He believed that his parent company, Nissan, using its Datsun brand, had a real chance to make a big impression in America, if only it built the right cars. After pleading with bosses for so long, 
to build the two cars, Nissan headquarters finally agreed. His 240Z ended up selling over 550,000 units worldwide. And from what he told me, Nissan bosses never formally thanked him. A couple of years before he passed, I asked him what he thought of the new 370Z. He said he'd rather drive a Nissan Versa family car because he believes the new Z is not living up to the 240Z legacy he created. What a character, going against the grain right up until the end. That was Mr. K. Launched in 1989, the Nissan Skyline GTR is a fascinating example of a car that had enthusiasts and media around the world crying foul as the company chose not to export it for 18 years through three generations. Because as soon as it hit the roads in Japan and the racetracks, it started winning races. Australia wanted the car so much that they were given five cars as well. In 1991-92, the GTR captured back-to-back -back titles in Australia's Bathurst 1000 endurance race, and the legend grew. When Britain's Top Gear magazine and TV show came to Tokyo to shoot a Japan special in 1994, Jeremy Clarkson wanted to drive a GTR. I worked as a consultant on that shoot, so I made sure Jeremy got behind the wheel of an R32 GTR. Using the typical dramatic Clarkson metaphors, he told me that the GTR's four-wheel drive system takes the laws of physics and wipes its shoes on them. The Skyline is one of the best cars I have ever driven. The GTR makes the Porsche 959 look like it came out of the design studios of Freddie Flintstone. When he drove the R34 version some years later, he called it the most advanced car on the planet. And when Top Gear came back in 2008 to film their GTR versus the bullet train race across Japan, I drove the lead car ahead of Jeremy to make sure he didn't get lost. <laughs> that was a very difficult job for me, probably the most difficult week of my life, because he kept wanting to break the speed limit. He also wanted to find out what a Japanese unmarked police car looked like. Because, as he said, that kind of thing makes for good television. Luckily, his speeding did not incur the wrath of the local constabulary. And I was lucky because I did not have to talk my way out of it in Japanese. For a man who is probably the most critical car commentator on the planet, he could not stop raving about the new R35 GTR, saying that not even NASA built the space shuttle like this. It was on the same Top Gear Japan special of 1994 that I introduced Jeremy to Keiichi Tsuchiya, better known as the Drift King. We went to a track and filmed a drift tournament and Clarkson marveled at how the Drift King, in much the same way as judges score ice skating, judged the drivers for drift angle amount of smoke and cornering control. Of course, these were the days before drifting had become a household word. In the show, Clarkson actually first refers to drifting and then defines it as the art of holding a car in a controlled oversteer slide. Today, we just say drifting. I remember explaining to him how drifting had legitimized itself into organized events in Japan. To which he said, it all looks quite mad when you first see it. But then you realize how much skill and finesse it takes to actually compete. This could catch on overseas. And of course it did. Now if you watch any episode of Top Gear, before he punched his producer in the face and was fired, you will see Clarkson drifting 
every chance he gets. 1997 was another watershed year for Japan with the birth of the Toyota Prius gasoline hybrid car, which sparked the global hybrid movement and the introduction of Gran Turismo, a driving simulation game that would go on to become the world's biggest selling driving game. We cannot understate the impact the Prius had on the world of motoring, as every hybrid car being offered today owes its existence and acceptance to the Prius. The latest version is the best handling and most frugal of them all. But according to one designer I spoke with, Toyota president Akio Toyota sent the original design back to the drawing board saying that it was not innovative enough for the next generation model. The problem was that now with the fourth generation Prius, there were far too many rivals to compete with, too many other hybrid cars with appealingly good looks. Toyota wanted to stress to his design team that a totally new interpretation of the now famous Prius design was what was needed from the design team. The new model is edgy and unique with its own identity. But to be bluntly honest, it's functional, but you can't call it pretty. The other cultural icon launched in 1997 was Gran Turismo. I met the game's creator, Kazunori Yamauchi, in early 1998, and we soon became gaming buddies. In 2009, I put a team together called the World Car Awards Race Team to compete in the 2010 Nürburgring 24-hour race, which is said to be the world's longest and most grueling endurance race. After securing ex-IndyCar pilot Hideshi Matsuda, I invited Yamauchi to join the team. I'd raced with him at Scuba Circuit in Japan, so I knew he was good. In our first one-hour endurance race together, we'd missed out on a podium by one-tenth of a second. But I didn't know just how good he was in more powerful cars on longer racetracks. I soon found out just how good he was. To prove beyond a doubt that his game was not only lifelike, but is an incredibly good driver training tool, he did a hot lap in our Lexus ISF race car in the Gran Turismo simulator above the pit lane and clocked a time of 9 minutes 48 seconds. That's in the virtual world. Then in the real race the following day, he posted a time of, you guessed it, exactly 9 minutes 48 seconds, proving that the game is as close to the real thing as possible. I can't think of any better way of certifying your brand than to blur the lines between virtual and real world. The whole crew was blown away and several mecha mechanics said this guy is a cyborg. <laughs> As his co-driver, I could only manage 9 minutes 53 in the game and in the actual race the following day, I clocked a time of 10 minutes flat, proving that I was just a mere mortal. Although in my defense, I had to say that I was actually caught in traffic, but that's just an excuse. Over the years, Gran Turismo has become more than just a driving game. Over the last 19 years, it has become part of our international motoring culture. And I'll tell you why. For the R35 GTR, Yamauchi was commissioned to design the dashboard display, which gives the readout of corner, cornering and braking Gs, as well as a lot of other data. Then eight years ago, Yamochi started the Gran Turismo Academy to make real world races out of Gran Turismo champion gamers. And in the following year that he started this, his champion driver was standing on the podium of Le Mans in the real world. He also created the Sema Gran Turismo Award and, and he presents a trophy every year in Las Vegas. He's also a judge at the Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance. 
And he's also created two virtual race cars with Red Bull Racing's Adrian Newey, who is arguably the best aerodynamicist on the planet. He also came up with the Vision Gran Turismo project, which pushes car manufacturers to think outside the box and create inspired styling to stimulate the world of car design. Yamauchi has also just collaborated with the FIA to create Gran Turismo Sport, two FIA online championships that allow participants to either play in the game or spectate. And best of all, the winner of each championship will be awarded in the same way as the real race winner at a prize giving ceremony held by the FIA. This will mark an historic moment in video gaming as Gran Turismo will officially be recognized as a motorsport. It's not only Japanese cars, technology and games that are changing the world. One traffic crossing in Tokyo that has gained fame around the world for its innovation and futuristic design is the Shibuya Crossing in Tokyo. It not only inspired the dark set creation for Harrison Ford's 19, 19, 1982 Blade Runner movie, but also featured strongly in the recent Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift movie. In a fascinating development several years ago, this iconic traffic crossing in central Tokyo became the blueprint for one of London's most famous landmarks. Taking inspiration from Shibuya District Crossing, London's Oxford Crossing Circus will stop traffic in all directions and allow pedestrians to cross diagonally as well as straight ahead, just like in Tokyo. I spoke with cultural trends guru Morinosuke Kawaguchi about the project and his comments highlighted the influence that Japanese design has around the world. The fact that London planners employed the Shibuya Street crossing as a blueprint for the famous landmark is only natural, he says. Shibuya just happens to be the global center for future fashion and pop culture trends. Energized by a youthful population of hair tinted, mobile phone slinging fashion adventure seekers, Shibuya is a fertile breeding ground for trendsetters in fashion, J-pop, music, cartoons, anime, design, and even automotive styling. Kawaguchi tells me that fashion and automotive trendsetters from around the world visit Shibuya every year. Japan is also right up there with the West when it comes to autonomous driving. Toyota and Nissan will be promoting autonomous driving for the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo. These manufacturers want to offer some of the most advanced driverless opportunities for athletes and visitors during the 2020 games. I've tried some of these technologies from Nissan, Toyota and Tesla. And while I found these technologies quite impressive, I've noticed that they can only work on restricted road conditions, like on highways with few obstacles. When I spoke to a Toyota executive recently, he said that while autonomous driving has a long way to go, there were just too many variables to make it not viable at the moment. You never know when a kid or a dog or a bicycle is going to dart out in front of you. And if you hit something while in autonomous mode, who takes responsibility? You or the car maker? To solve that question, my Toyota executive said would probably take another five to 10 years. In conclusion, I believe that a new golden era for Japan has just begun. Just look at what's happening now. We have the new Prius, which is the best handling, most radical looking, most fuel efficient Prius ever. 
we have the new Mazda MX-5. Then we have the Toyota Mirai, which is the world's first fuel cell car. We have the new Honda NSX, which is just coming onto the market. You have the Honda Clarity fuel cell car, a vehicle that offers one more seat and a longer range than the Toyota Mirai. Then, of course, you have the Mazda RX Vision rotary concept that will see a reborn rotary sports car by 2020. And from what I'm hearing, Nissan is rethinking its halo car, the GTR, to be born again as a hybrid with more power and better mileage. I'm also hearing that Subaru are working on a mid-engine sports car with electric motors driving the front wheels. And who can ignore the Toyota Supra successor currently being developed by Toyota and BMW? And of course, a new compact Toyota SFR that I'm hearing will be built by Daihatsu, who of course were just bought by Toyota. And by the time that and by the time Nissan planned to do deliver the, their most advanced autonomous driving network, we will see that in 2020. For my part, I look forward to seeing what Nissan does with its next generation GTR. And I also can't wait to see how Mazda tones down its rotary powered RX Vision concept. Actually, I tell a lie. I don't want them to tone it down at all. But what I'd really like to see is Clarkson and his gang come back to Japan. I wonder what they'd do. Maybe they'll drive a hydrogen-powered Mirai fuel cell car on an autonomous driving binge across the country while racing the Honda Jet and checking its levels of pedestrian safety and teenager friendliness. And so I find myself today, much as I did as a boy in the Aussie outback, mesmerized by the world of one of America's greatest inventions, the automobile, and captivated by one of the car's greatest innovators, Japan. Only now it's, global, it's a global whirlwind as the Koreans and Chinese join the Americans and Europeans in this monumental battle of cultures and technology. What an honor it is for me to be an active observer of this fight for supremacy. Speaking of supremacy, that's exactly what brings me to New York this week to announce the winner of the World Car of the Year, which I'll do at the Javits Center on Thursday morning. Obviously, I will also be checking out the new concepts at the New York International Auto Show, which I hope to see you at on Friday. Thank you very much. Before we start, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about Gran Turismo because it's pretty hard yes. to overstate the importance of that game in the US. When it came here, uh, it was a f phenomenon and they did so little to change that game from the Japanese market to the US market that it was full of dozens of cars that we'd never heard of before, the FTO and, and all these special edition uh, Skylines and everything else that we'd never seen. Uh, and that, I think, really created the, the import tuner culture here in the US, which absolutely didn't exist. And, and that's pretty, pretty amazing. I totally agree. Um, for example, I spoke about the GTR, the Nissan GTR earlier. And as I said, it was not exported for three generations, but the world got to know about the GTR through Gran Turismo. Yeah, I don't you have can't a friend who did that. go buy that car and put crazy wheels on it and boost it up to 1,000 horsepower. And I tell you what, if you, if you own a Gran Turismo game and you're a, you're a gamer, and in your garage, garage, if you don't have a Nissan Skyline GTR, a Subaru Impreza mm -hmm. STI, and a Mitsubishi Lancer Evolution, I mean, you don't know what you're talking about. You're, you're playing it wrong, absolutely. Well, what do you have in your garage? Uh, my real one or my, my Gran Turismo? In your garage? virtual garage. My, oh, too many cars to count. I'm happy to say I do have an STI in my real garage and an MR2 and uh, an Oro Impreza, so I'm a bit of a Japanese car fan myself. I see. No, because no it, was the, it was Gran Turismo that actually introduced the GTR and, of course, the uh, WRX STI and the Evo right, in terms of their uh, rallying uh, prestige. Previous because to that, we only had the Subaru, uh, the Impreza RS, which was a very low spec compared to 
the WRX, which we didn't have in the US at the time, and the SDI, we certainly didn't mm. have at the time. Mm. And it was interesting racing with Yamauchi at Nürburgring uh, because he didn't just bring 20 staff with him to take photographs and, and video, but he brought about, I think it was about five suitcases of uh, technical equipment that he put in the car, and we were all worried about weight. <laughs> because, of course, as you know, with race cars, uh, it's all about um, trying to make the car as light as possible so that it, it can go around the track as fast as possible. But he, I think he added more than 10 kilograms of, of equipment to record the G-forces, the speed, the braking, um, the noise of the car that were put back into the game. So the game that you, you drive now actually has sounds from that race. That's amazing. Do you have any questions in the audience? If so, raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you. We have uh, somebody up front here. Uh, I do ask you to please use the mic. This is being recorded, so I want to make sure that we uh, can hear everybody. So, <coughs> yes, sir. Masuzumi Nakayama City Group. Is um, a Japanese company only using Japanese to design the latest model? Do they use non-Japanese as a designer? That's, to a, that's a very good question because, may I start by saying, uh, firstly, that they do have a, most card manufacturers do have a mix of, of designers now. That's from uh, Japan, of course, America, Europe, uh, China, and Korea now. Um, but the Koreans really went a long way ahead of Japan by putting their chief of design, they actually pinched him from uh, Audi, I think it was, a guy named Peter Schreyer. Uh, but I've been suggesting as you do in Japan, you all have to circumlocute all the time, as you know. Um, I've been suggesting that they need to sort of ramp up their design departments uh, because they're not quite keeping up with you know, new players on the market like the Koreans. The Koreans, I think, have caught up with the Japanese and, and they've actually gone one page ahead in terms of design. Um, you know, Jap Japan has come so far in the last 40 years, but I think they really need to just change gear, change from fifth into sixth now, yeah. Thank you. Any Australians? And there are some Australian designs as well, yeah. Although, unfortunately, I'm sad to say that the Australian car industry will <laughs> not exist very soon because everyone's pulling out. Holden. Yes. And because Holden and Ford are pulling out, Toyota and Mitsubishi are pulling out too. But that's, that's unfortunate, but that's how... It, so. Which is good in a way because it means that there will be no um, duties and, and import taxes on cars coming into Australia now. So we'll be hopefully we'll get cheaper prices for cars in Australia. Yeah. Next question. Yes, sir. I, I was wondering if you could say a few words about uh, the, the cultural cross-linking of design. Uh, America may be the largest recipient of Japanese cars, and I'm wondering if there's a design initiative coming out of maybe New York or other parts of the country to augment uh, that market share that Japan enjoys. Well, I must say that um, both Lexus and Acura are very uh, heavily uh, American-oriented now. A lot of the design you see uh, coming out of, of um, Lexus and Infiniti and Acura, uh, there's a lot of American design coming out of there. Um, I think in Europe as well, uh, Nissan and Honda and Toyota, of course, have uh, all, they all have design studios in Germany and, uh, and the UK, and they are all focusing, on, focusing more and more on local designs that appeal to uh, local markets. Like you'll have a, a, base, a base car like, for example, a Civic or an Accord or, or um, even an SUV that, that has the, the base sheet metal, but they'll change the front of the car completely for that market. Um, you know, like a CRV or a, um, a, a RAV4 or something like that. They'll just change the front, the grill, the lights uh, to make it more, more palatable for a, a local market. But to, uh, your question is very interesting because there's, design is one of the, the most difficult topics to talk about because it's, it's a very subjective thing. And, um, I, I would agree that the more American influence and more Western influence on Japan, I think the better quality design we, we'll see coming out of Japan. Um, there are some good designs coming out of Japan, but I think there just needs to be more, 
more sort of design focused on on their uh, you know inside their design studios. I was actually speaking with someone from Acura this afternoon at an earlier event and. Uh, I got the interesting factoid that 98% of all Acuras are made in the U.S., which is quite interesting. And in fact, they will be changing to be a quote-unquote American car manufacturer this year because greater than 50% of all cars that have ever been sold in the U.S. through Acura have been built here in the U.S., so that's pretty mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. So obviously a very, very important market uh, for Acura. I, th I think so. Because um, uh, Acura, the only place that Acura exists is, right. is here. Yes. Um, we, don't have, we don't have Infinity in Japan. We don't have Acura in Japan. Um, so Acura is is American. I mean, if you went out into the the marketplace and you said you have an Acura, how many how many people walking out there would say, "Oh, that's a Japanese manufacturer"? I would argue that three, four, five out of ten people would not actually know where Acura actually comes from. Probably true. Next question. Um, you spoke about a little bit of um, autonomous vehicles, specifically around the 2020 Olympics. Can you talk about what's going on with um, you know, shared ownership of vehicles, for instance, Uber in Japan, and what, if any, impact that's having on you know, cultural design for cars, or you know, are, are any of the Japanese automakers reacting to shared ownership of vehicles, for instance, people um, you know, n not owning a car, but using like an Uber-like service? Is that affecting a a a any of the norms at all? You mean on design? On the design and also design just, of cars? Just, just culture as well uh, w within the Japanese automakers. Shared, shared cars are not, uh, not as, po as popular in Japan as they are here. Um, Japanese tend to enjoy owning and driving or leasing their own, their own cars. It's not a, it does exist in a, in a very small way, um, but it's not a, not a, a, a popular thing over there. Um, I think that... Toyota, Nissan, and Honda are all joining forces to coordinate the the technology that needs to be employed to make this autonomous driving event happen in Japan, um, and it's being ramped up very quickly in the next uh, couple of years to, to you know to be in time for the 2020 Olympics. Because as I don't know what you've been hearing over here, but the Abe administration, the, the the government is really putting a lot of pressure on on Japanese companies to really, you know, show off what, what the country can do. Um, it's not just changing the constitution. Uh, we, we won't go into that. But um, it's, it's changing uh, the mentality towards cars and it's trying to see how far uh, these major three manufacturers, the big three in, in Japan, can, can take uh, car uh, autonomous driving in the near future. Uh, as I said, a Toyota executive um, did actually say to me that he believes, I believe you have some interesting things to say about autonomous driving too, but um, he, he believes that while we will see an autonomous driving cars on the road actually doing what they're meant to do, it will only happen in restricted areas. You won't see them on local, local roads. Um, and because, of course, you know, you have the, the liability issue, uh, you have um, the acceptance issue as well. People, you, the government has to make people aware of this and accept it at the same time. I was just speaking with uh, John Kraftchik, who's the CEO of Google's uh, self-driving program uh, this afternoon. And interestingly, he sees us as actually using our cars a lot more once we do move to an autonomous state because of car sharing. A lot of people think that once we have autonomous cars, we can have services like Uber that'll be much more efficient because the cars can drive themselves. If you're at work, your car can be on picking up passengers and maybe earning you a bit of money. And because of that, he sees that cars are going to be used a lot more frequently than now. You know, your average car does about 12,000 miles a year here in the U.S. He thinks it'll be 150,000 miles per year in the U.S. just because your car will never be sitting idle, which is a pretty interesting idea. You know, there's a lot of fear that dealerships are going to go away, that car manufacturers are going to go away because you'll need fewer cars. But if you're putting 150,000 miles in your car every year, you might need a new car uh, every, mm. every other mm. year, mm. which could actually result in, in more sales. Yeah. I think your, your comment about the sharing will actually, to think of it, will change uh, the way that, that cars are used in Japan. Um, because if, if we are being forced or suggested to use, to share cars, then I think the, the population will uh, understand that. And uh, you know, if you, we're being offered autonomous driving cars, then I think more and more people will 
come around to it. It's just the, the government has to you know, make people understand and accept it. Do you feel like there's more pressure in Japan to develop uh, autonomous driving? I know from covering the consumer technology side of things in Japan, there's a strong interest in elder care because of the aging population in Japan. That seems like a major attraction for autonomous cars in theory because rather than having to have the uncomfortable conversation with mom or dad about maybe taking your license away at some point, uh, with an autonomous car, you, they can still be completely self-sufficient without being a risk to somebody on the road. Is that something that's talked about in Japan that more is, than in the US? That is, um, it is being talked about because uh, the Japanese car industry actually has, I, I would argue, the most advanced form of, of um, technology for, for the handicapped. Um, they, have, they have seats that come out of cars. They have uh, wheelchair ramps that just fold out of cars. They have special doors that open to allow easy access. Uh, they have special uh, driving facilities for people that um, do not have all of their appendages. Um, so I, I can see that people will be offered those sort of cars uh, in the near future. Next question. Yes, sir. In the context of the autonomous car, that's going to require some trust. Japanese cars are remarkably reliable, but they also there's also sometimes a breakdown in the engineering, like the unintended acceleration. Could you comment a little bit about how Jap Japanese car makers achieve such reliability and what happens when it breaks down? How do they? Yes, that's a very interesting question. We could talk about that all night. Um, they they achieve that level of reliability because they're so meticulous about what they do. I mean, in every aspect of of life, from the I mean, you go to a, a train station, the, the Shinkansen bullet train, which does uh, 300 kilometers an hour, that will stop. If you if you drew a chalk mark on the ground, it would stop within three inches of that of that line at the time you expect it to stop. If it's meant to stop at 4.01, it will stop at 4.01. This is, this is this, the meticulous nature that they take to their cars and they, they will employ a level of reliability that um, doesn't really exist in other, in other car makers around the world. Although, although I will admit with your, your comment about, uh, you're talking about the Toyota uh, uh, problem there, the recall problem they had, um, they, did have a real issue with that because they were trying to push too hard to expand their market share and increase their numbers of cars. So they just there was a little uh, problem that 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 snuck into their their level of efficiency and reliability, and that's where that came out of. But the the, the thing is with recalls, um, every every car maker on the planet doesn't matter which car maker, has a recall basically once every three or four years. So, and I think that because the Japanese cars are expected to be so reliable all the time, when a Toyota has a major recall or a Honda with the Takata airbag uh, problem, that was a very big issue as well, and I believe it's still a, a big issue here. I believe you're seeing it in the news all the time. Um, these issues do affect the manufacturer to a certain extent. You, s you will see sales drop just a little bit but because they are considered to be so reliable around the world, especially Toyota and Honda in the JD Power surveys, they're always finishing in the top 10. Uh, consumer surveys, always finishing very highly. Um, they do always bounce back. I mean, Toyota had one of the biggest recalls in history, and it still bounced back to be the world's biggest car maker, the, the biggest producer of cars. So, um, you know, we, the level of reliability will always be very high with Japanese cars, and you can expect your car to start every morning uh, when you go out, you know, on a cold morning. Great. Uh, next question. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, I have a question about all-wheel drive. I wonder if you can comment on all-wheel drive. I mean, here in the Northeast, with a lot of snow and ice storms, people like to buy all-wheel drive vehicles. Um, they tend to be SUVs, or I guess there are some uh, performance cars, you know, like the Volkswagen, I think the GTIR or something like that is, is all-wheel drive. But, and then, of course, there's Subaru, which is all-wheel drive with all of their vehicles. And I just wonder, um, you know, and, and if Mercedes and BMW, their sedans, uh, are, you can get an all-wheel drive. But it seems that the Japanese, with the exception of Subaru, are not going there, and I just wonder if you can comment on on that in general and maybe specifically 
Uh, yes. If I was going to recommend any car, I would say buy a Subaru. I would as well. Because, uh, especially, I'm sorry, when I say any car, I mean in, in an area where you get a lot of snow. I would say buy a, a Subaru because it's, it has the best cost performance and one of the best four-wheel drive um, powertrains on the planet. Um, you would agree with that? I would agree. And, and I can talk about all-wheel drive systems all night long. So in the, in the reception, <laughs> in afterward, the reception I'll be happy yeah, to talk yeah. about torsion but, differentials but versus friction clutches and yeah. everything else. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I, Subaru is leading in, in the four-wheel drive uh, area, but Toyota and Nissan and Mitsubishi are also offering four-wheel drive uh, SUVs. And, I mean, you can get, you can get um, four-wheel drive in, in most, uh, from most manufacturers, in most mid-size models. Uh, so if you want a, a list of cars, I can, I can send them to you. Um, but and even I the, the new NSX, which is a performance car, is all-wheel drive, though in a very different way. That has a gasoline engine driving the rear wheels, but a pair of electric motors up front driving the front wheels. So uh, a very different way of, of giving all-wheel drive, but, and also giving the advantages of a hybrid system without actually having to connect the two motors. You've got a mm. through-the-road effective hybrid system, which is pretty yeah. interesting way to we, In fact, we will see similar technology uh, from other manufacturers as well. As I mentioned, Subaru. Uh, um, don't mention this outside this room, but uh, they are working Upload on values. a... You, no, you haven't heard this, right? They, they are actually working on a sports car that will have engine behind your head and it will have uh, front, uh, front motors, uh, electric motors at the front, so, which is very similar to the NSX, but you didn't hear that here. Hof oh, oh, hopefully a bit cheaper than the NSX. Uh, I think yes. we've got time for about one more question. Yes, ma'am. I've been hoping for a long time, so I'm assuming the answer is going to be no, but I'm going to throw it out there. I love the style of cars from like the 60s going back, maybe up to the early 70s, and I haven't liked anything basically since the 80s. Are they ever going to start making again variety and, and visual? <coughs> that's, that's a very good question because um, Mr. K uh, from, from Nissan, who started uh, Nissan USA, and, two f and he was behind the 240Z, he actually said to me that he believes car design stopped in the 1970s. Uh, it just stopped, and we, we, uh, after that, it, it's all just gone downhill. He said cars were fun to drive back then. They were not too difficult. They were not too um, advanced. You could actually work on a car yourself. You could fiddle with the engine, play with the suspension and brakes. Now you open the, the hood... And, you know, it's just like a maze of, of uh, metal and wires under there, and you don't want to go anywhere near that. But in terms of design, the problem is, yes, I, I would love to see those sort of designs come back, but the problem is um, safety and aerodynamics and fuel efficiency, and all manufacturers are obligated to create cars that are as safe as they can be. So, it, But when, when I say that, it means that they have to pass a certain uh, frontal crash test. They have to pass the, the side test as well. Um, they have to have so many airbags. They have to have a uh, pedestrian uh, safety now. You know, hoods that have little airbags under them that pop up to you know, absorb the, the impact of a, of a pedestrian. So unfortunately, you cannot make cars like that anymore. Although with sports cars, of course, they do have the, you know, the sharp fronts on them, but they are um, very heavily tested with, uh, for crash testing. So unfortunately, we won't see designs as cool as those, but you will see something like that in the near future. Something. Yeah. But perhaps if we get far enough with an autonomous future where we don't have crashes anymore, then at that point we can make cars look like how we want to. But that may be a little while yet. Not in my lifetime, but anyway, we'll perhaps see about not. that. Yeah. Peter, I think we're out of time. Thank okay. you very much, Peter. It was a great presentation. And again, we'll Thank be you in very the much. Thank you very much.